All right, we're going to talk this morning about um, eternal security. So go first to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Now the, the question comes up, uh, can a born-again Christian lose their salvation? You know, they say, once saved, always saved, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, there's a, a movement here uh, that's getting more and more popular that Christians are going to go through the tribulation and you're going to have to endure to the end and everything. You know, and the false prophets, like I said last week, the false prophets are just coming out of the woodwork right now. And they're all teaching this thing that you can lose your salvation. They all cast doubt on your salvation. So I wanted to do this message here to prove that a Christian today cannot lose their salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. First point. Well, here I'll read the verse. Okay. Uh, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that's a very familiar passage in Scripture, but I think a lot of people just kind of read over it and they don't actually look at what it's really saying. So the first point in can you... Can you lose your salvation is no, because it's not your salvation. You had no part in it other than saying, yeah, I'm a sinner, acknowledging the fact that you're a sinner, acknowledging that, okay, I can repent of this, which means to turn you know, from your sins, that way of life, and turn to God for salvation. So that's really the only thing that you had to do to get saved. And of course, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, can confess with your mouth as it says there in Romans you know that's the only really real part that you played in your salvation the the work of salvation was done on the cross by Jesus Christ it's his blood that cleanses you from your sins your works have nothing to do with it okay it says right there not of works verse 9 lest any man should boast it's the gift of god so number 1 you can't lose your salvation because it's not your salvation. It's not something that you have to work for. Okay, now go over to Titus 3.5. We're going to see a similar thing here. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He saved us. We didn't save ourselves. How can you lose something if somebody else did the work? Okay, now go to Romans chapter 4. Now this is a very interesting thing here. This is a, a unique word that we're going to be looking at. Romans chapter 4 verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 8. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. I remember it said, not of works lest any man should boast. If you get saved by your good works, it would lead to pride. It would lead to boasting, wouldn't it? You'd have people that were more saved than those that do not, you know, they don't do as good of works. So you'd have different levels of salvation if it was based on works, which is pretty ridiculous. Verse 3, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, you don't work for your salvation. It's by faith that you're saved. Your faith is what's counted for righteousness. That's what counts. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now the word there that's very important is imputeth. We're going to look at what that means here in a minute, but let's continue here saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay, what does impute mean? Uh, well, we don't have to bother turning there. I'll just read the verse quickly. Philemon, verse 18. There's only one chapter in Philemon, so 
Verse 18 says, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Now that's the perfect definition of imputing. Okay, when you impute something, it's you have no part in it. Somebody else takes your sin and puts it on themselves. And of course, we know that that was Jesus Christ. That's what he did on the cross. Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And we're going to see about this thing. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, who's the him there? Well, verse 20, Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ became sin on the cross. He took our sins on himself, and they were paid for on the cross. All right, that's important to remember that. So what's the imputation there? God put our sins on Jesus Christ at the cross, and he took the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and he put it on those that believe. Okay, our righteousness, our salvation, is through the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's imputed to us. We owe God a perfect sinless life. Okay? We're not supposed to sin. We can't do that. But we accept Jesus Christ's righteousness, and then that perfect sinless life is imputed to us. It's given to us. But it's only when we have faith in Jesus Christ and put, put our, our trust in Him and His finished work on the cross, that's when that righteousness is imputed. Our record is then blotted out as far as our sinful record in terms of eternal judgment okay we're going to look at the thing about when a christian sins we'll look at that here in a little bit but uh, okay for now let's go to um john 19 verse 30 what were what were the last words that jesus christ said when he died on the cross it is finished. We'll just look at the verse here very quickly. I think most of us are familiar with it. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished for those who endure to the end. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Is that what it says? <laughs> no. It is finished. Okay? His death on the cross was all that you needed to pay for your sins. Okay? It's there. It's complete. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay? Now, believing as I do that the book of Hebrews is primarily written to Jews in the tribulation, um, I do believe that salvation is similar for them in that the blood of Jesus Christ is there to cleanse them from their sins, but they have the added thing there in the tribulation of having to endure to the end in in so far as they can't take the mark of the beast okay you take the mark of the beast you lose it and that's why you have the verses in the book of hebrews that say that if you fall away it's impossible to renew you again to repentance that's what i believe is going on there okay we're going to cover that a little bit more in greater detail in a little bit here but the point is point number one you can't lose your salvation because it's not your salvation. Okay? And and by the way, I will say this, there is a very great danger, and we have it around here especially, with a lot of the Mennonites and the Amish and things. They teach that you can lose your salvation. Okay, well then how do you keep your salvation? By good works. And I think some of them, may, not all of them, I think some of them are you know really genuinely saved and good people. But there could be some 
that are counting on their own works, on their own righteousness to get them saved. I mean, that's that's how you can lose it. You know, if a, if a young Mennonite woman would come to church and she'd be wearing jeans and no head covering, everybody in there would probably say, oh, she lost her salvation. See, they base it on works. They base it on the outward ordinances, fleshly ordinances. And that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. And I'm not just, you know, I'm not trying to single out Mennonites and Amish. I'm just saying, you know, there are a lot of people that are like that. I think even some of the real conservative Baptists are similar to that. You know, some of them, I think, can kind of cross that line where they start making works a necessary thing to get saved. And it isn't. It's not of works. Okay, point number two. Um, turn to Ephesians chapter one. Point number two is going to be your state versus your standing. Okay, those are two. They're related, but they're two different things. Uh, your state is what what you are from now till eternity, but your standing is something completely different. And a lot of Christians, their state is that they're saved. Their standing is that they're very wicked and they're getting kicked around and beat around down here because they've done a lot of stupid things. State and standing are two different things. We're going to look at that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. Okay, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Okay, these are saved people. Verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye... In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, uh, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, what's the purchased possession there? What does that mean? Well, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says about God, you know, talking about overseers, and it says about which God hath purchased with his own blood. So we are the purchased possession. Your life is not your own. You are bought with a price, the Bible says. So the blood that was shed on the cross was the price that had to be paid to get us saved. So there again, you see this thing of your life is not your own when you get saved. Okay, it's, it's the gift of God. God paid the price and now he owns you. So... What are you worried about losing your salvation for? If he paid the price, if you're his purchased possession. Okay, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Watch what you say. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves inside you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? He's in there. So guess what happens when you tell a dirty joke? Guess what happens when you say something that you shouldn't say? He's right there. It's not that the Holy Ghost stepped out for five minutes and he'll be back, you know. No, he's right there and he's grieved by that. That's why you should be careful what you say. You hear a dirty joke, it should make you feel dirty. You shouldn't want to repeat it to somebody else. Oh, wow, you know, I just wanted to tell you this joke here and I don't necessarily agree with it. Shut your mouth. Don't tell that joke again. Why? You're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. But look, it says there, okay, it's talking about evil communications coming out of your mouth and it says grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption why doesn't it say grieve not the holy spirit of god because you might lose your salvation you yeah you can't you're sealed okay you get saved and the blood is on you you're purchased okay it's important to remember that verse 31 let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay, I just wanted to read those verses there because that's important to remember that. Now, what is our state 
with God. Okay. Look over at verse 1 there, chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. What is your relationship to God when you get saved? You are a son or a daughter of God. Okay, now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. We're going to see this thing about being a child of God. This is also one of the most important passages in the New Testament for a Christian. Uh, we're just going to read some of these verses here again quickly. Okay, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay, your relationship to God is that he is your father. And again, as I stated earlier, that's why you pray, Heavenly Father. Okay, the Godhead, they are all one. I realize that. Jesus is God. I know. But they're separate in their their offices, if you will. Okay, God is our Father. And it's interesting, too, because what was Jesus Christ called? The Son of God. All right, and we're going to look into that just a little bit more, too. But um, there are three places in the Bible, and I'll just read them here. There are three places where the term Abba, Father, shows up. Kind of interesting that it would be the number three, you know. That's nothing to that, though. That's just a coincidence, of course, you know. We, we The Bible's just a translation. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. No, it's God's perfect word, the King James Bible. Mark 14, verse 36, And he said, Abba, Father... All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Who said it? Jesus Christ. He called God Abba Father. All right. Second reference. Romans 8.15 For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry Abba Father. Who said it? Well, Paul did, but who are the we there? Christians. Okay. Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, one reference is to Jesus Christ saying, Abba, Father. The other two are for Christians. Okay, so what's your state with God? When he purchases you, you know, if you want to adopt a child... Does it cost money? Yes. It costs a lot of money, actually, here in America, you know, because that's the way that they promote abortion, but that's another story. But the point is, when you adopt a child, it costs you money. Well, guess what? When God adopted us, it cost him something. You know, it cost him his blood. God purchased us with his blood. Acts 20, verse 28. So... We are his adopted children. That's our state. Now what is our standing? I'll turn over to Revelation 4, verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Why did God create each of us? Well, it answers it right here. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Why did God create us? For His pleasure. You know? I mean, that's that's really our purpose here on this earth. You know, I can say in kind of a very, very small way that, you know, I've created things out of wood, and I've seen those wood turnings, they go to different people. And some people, you go over to their house after they have the wood turning and, 
and you see it sitting in a corner or something like that with a bunch of junk on it or something or it's broken that doesn't bring me much pleasure you know it kind of hurts my feelings but you go to somewhere else and you see somebody with one of those wood turnings and it's in a very prominent place and you can tell that they're taking care of it and they really like it and they're showing it to everybody well that's you know makes you feel good well God's very much the same way God looks down at his creation and he first of all when they get saved that's a great thing you know that's that's the main thing but then what are they doing with their lives and he looks down and he sees a Christian down there and he sees him witnessing and passing out tracts and he hears from him a lot in prayer and he sees him spending time reading the Bible and it brings God pleasure. Then he sees a Christian, another one down there, and there he is, he's over there with that wrong crowd telling dirty jokes. Isn't it kind of interesting that a lot of parents don't want their kids hanging out with certain children, you know, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? Kind of interesting. I don't want you hanging out with those kids, son, because they're going to mess you up. They'll lead you astray. You know? Same thing with God. There are certain people God does not want us hanging out with. All right? So that's important to remember. We are created for God's pleasure. Now turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. One of the things that every child has to go through, doesn't matter what century, uh, every child has to go through a period where they learn things, where they have to study, where they have to be tested. Every child has to go through it. Okay, Even before they had schools or whatever, every child has to be tested. Okay, And if a child does good in a test, they're rewarded for it. Now what happens if a child fails the test? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, you get saved first. Verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Sorry to the Catholics, there is no purgatory. Man is not being tried, it's his works that are tried. Okay, verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now that's speaking of the judgment seat of Christ. And what's going to happen is, down here, the Bible says that you're going to have trials and tribulations. Trials. What's a trial? It's a test. Sometimes God will allow your faith to be tried. He'll, he'll allow your patience, your long suffering. He'll allow a lot of that stuff to be tried. And God is expecting you to pass the test. And when you pass the test, it brings him pleasure and it brings him joy. When you fail the test, eh. Not so much so, you know, and it, well, well, then you'll lose your salvation. No, 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 no. Your state is that you are a child of God. Your standing is different story. Okay. If you're failing test after test after test down here, well, you're a disobedient child. You're a bad kid and you're probably going to get a whipping. <laughs> you know, I can attest to that. You know, I've failed quite a few tests. I mean, it's not a good idea. And, of course, the thing for a Christian is that, you know, you don't dwell on your past there. You move forward, which we'll get into here in a minute or two. So, we are God's children. That's not going to change. You know, when you are born in this world, you have a father, you have a mother. Okay, now nothing is ever going to change that fact. You can change your name, you can change your address, you can change anything. You can refuse to ever see them again. The point is you're still their child. Okay. Your best bet is to honor your parents so that things go good. Okay, so that's um, that's how it is with God and, and us. We are his children. Now let's go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh what is our state with Jesus Christ? 
What's our relationship to Jesus Christ? When you get saved, what is your state in Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We went over this on uh, our Thursday night Bible study here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Okay, what are we called? Christians. Why? Because we are of Christ. We are His body here on the earth. Look down at verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay, now it goes into the whole thing of all the members have different offices and there are different gifts and everything else. It's a good chapter to read to go over. But the point is, you are a member of the body of Christ. Now, if you can lose your salvation and get it back and lose it and get it back and lose it and get it back, do you mean it? You know, Jesus is, is having a part of his body amputated, and then he puts it back on, then it's amputated again, then he puts it back on. You see, it's it's a ridiculous teaching to teach that you can lose it and get it back and lose it and get it back and lose it and get it back. It's just nonsense. You are a member of the body of Christ. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to see what else you are as a Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now if you read Revelation 19, you'll read about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are his bride also. You say, oh, whoa, wait a second here. That doesn't make any sense. That's a contradiction. How can we be his body and his bride at the same time? doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, if you read the Bible... You'll see it does. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31. Here you have uh, Paul is, is basically quoting back in Genesis. And he says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Is it possible to be the bride and the husband at the same time? Yes, it is. Uh, verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. There you have it. So what is your state? With God, you are his child. With Jesus Christ, you are a member of his body as well as his bride. You are married to Jesus Christ, in a sense. I mean, we're kind of engaged down here right now. Eventually, we're going to be married at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the point is, you are part of Jesus Christ, and you are a son or a daughter of God. So that's your state with Jesus Christ. But what is your standing with Jesus Christ? Well, that's a different thing. Second Timothy chapter 2. What happens when you blow it? What happens when you start sinning? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, I covered this verse last week, but I'll just kind of restate it here again. It's not, you know, some people are saying, well, they'd say, well, then he's going to deny us. That means we won't be saved. No, because if you look at the verse or the first part of that verse, it says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. It's talking about your inheritance. Okay, there's your standing. Your state is, you are saved. Your standing is a different thing. Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. When you are saved, you are a member of the body of Christ. He will not deny himself. <laughs> okay, but it's interesting there, it says, He abideth faithful. What's the term that people use in marriage? 
has he been faithful? Hmm. Interesting. You know, there's a lot of women right now that their husband or their fiance or whatever is over in Iraq or Afghanistan. And they probably wonder, has he been faithful? Well, a good husband would be. Now, a lot of them are rotten to the core and they probably haven't been faithful. And the woman at home's probably not been faithful either. But not so with Jesus Christ. He's with God in heaven. He's going to be faithful to his bride down on the earth. And if she steps out of line, well, she's going to have to be corrected and whatever else. But he's going to remain faithful. He promised, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's a promise. Okay? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, maybe they'll be saved. If they do the right things, they'll be saved. No, shall be saved. Okay, you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. Your standing, well, that's something else. And we're going to look at that right now. 1 John chapter 1. What happens when a Christian sins? Because that's really the issue. You know, if you can lose your salvation, what is it based on? Well, it's based on your sin. It's based on, you know, if you start to mess around with things or whatever. So let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Does it say that we lose our salvation? No. It's just saying if you want to have fellowship with God, don't be walking in darkness. Don't be sinning. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. I'm going to say something here and you can take it for whatever you want. You can't live without sin. Why? Because your body has not been redeemed. Your flesh is not redeemed. Okay, your flesh is still corruptible. Your flesh is still capable of all the sins that the unsaved can do. Every single one of them. Your soul has been redeemed and your spirit has been quickened. Your flesh is still dead. It's still capable of sin. And if you think that, you know, there are some of the charismatics, and I know the Nazarenes teach that, when you get saved, your old nature is eradicated. That's nonsense. And it's interesting because, the, you know, well, I, don't, I don't drink and I don't fornicate and I don't do drugs and I don't commit adultery and I'm not into witchcraft, you know. What about pride? What about strife? You know? I think they call those mistakes, not sin. Yeah, those are mistakes, mistakes. right. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Christian mistakes. <laughs> uh-huh. You're going to sin. Okay, covetousness, you know, uh-huh, yeah, Christians aren't guilty of that one. Go past the average church building and you'll see the thing of covetousness <laughs> in abundance. Okay, don't give me this stuff that you aren't going to sin after you're saved. That's nonsense. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. And of course people say, oh, then then you can get away with anything. If Jesus' blood you know, cleanses you from all sin, then, then that means you can live your life however you want. Well, let's look about that. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Live any longer therein. It doesn't say that you aren't going to commit it. It says you shouldn't be living in sin. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, every Christian that I've ever seen that's really doing something for the Lord and that's really on fire for the Lord lived a rotten, miserable, sinful life before they got saved. And they get to that point where they're just like, I don't want to live like this anymore. 
and they get saved and they turn and they go in a different direction you know but they all have that same testimony that they knew that they confessed that they were a sinner and you have some of these quote unquote Christians today that you can't get them to admit that they're a sinner there's a problem there okay there's a big problem there uh, you should walk in newness of life verse 5 for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin now if we be dead with Christ we believe that we shall also live with him okay so the point is sin is something that's negative you shouldn't want to live any more any longer in that okay now go to Romans chapter 7 verse 14 and of course people you know well I think it's saying that you shouldn't live in sin and you should never sin again well let's look at the finest Christian in the Bible Romans chapter 7 verse 14 for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. How many times should you have been reading your Bible and instead you did something else that you knew you shouldn't be doing? Yeah. A lot. How many times when you should have been praying... Were you spending your time coveting something? Plenty. And I'm not saying, ah, oh, you know, ha, ha, ha. I'm not laughing about the sin. It's sin. And it is, it is wrong. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of it. Let's continue here. Verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. He doesn't say spirit. He doesn't say soul. He says flesh. Your flesh is not redeemed. For I, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There you go. How's that for your modern self-esteem? You know, the body of this death. Oh, boy. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You will struggle with sin. You will, you will have to fight it for the rest of your life. Okay, you will have be at war within yourself. <laughs> you know, that's something to think about there. Turn over to Galatians chapter 5. This is where we're going to finish it. Uh, before I read these verses here, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, down through the end there of the chapter, I just want to say something quick. I'm not going to spend any time here trying to refute the passages, you know, the unpardonable sin, the verses in Hebrews, Judas Iscariot, you know. You have all these arguments against eternal security. But I want you to realize all three of those, Judas Iscariot, the unpardonable sin, and the verses in Hebrews, all three of those say that if you blow it, if you sin, you can't get it back. Okay? Now these people that teach that you can lose your salvation, they're all teaching that you can get it back. And, and yet they'll quote those verses which say you can't. Isn't that something? You know, show me some verses in Scripture that say that you can lose it and get it back. Then maybe you'll have an argument, you know. And of course, well, we can find them in the Old Testament. Yeah, you know, whatever. You're going back under the law. You're going, you know, it's not our dispensation. Okay, so don't be going back to the Old Testament. 
Um, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. Um, what's the way to put down the flesh? Walk in the Spirit. Well, no, no. I, you know, I think that if I set out a a forty day of purpose or a five step plan, that I can, you know, really get more spirit. Listen, if you're not reading your Bible and if you're not praying, and if you're not trying to do something to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are going to fall flat on your face as a Christian and blow it. That's the only solution. Things that are spiritual. Don't don't give me this stuff of trying to sanctify your flesh and make your pretty up your flesh. Your flesh is a dead corpse. You can't make a dead corpse pretty. <laughs> okay? It stinks. <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about one, you know, to the world we're a savor of death unto death, you know. <laughs> and I mean, that's the way it is. You know, we are we are kind of a contradiction because we're spiritual inside a dead body, essentially a dying body. All right, you can't pretty up your flesh. What you have to do is you have to walk in the spirit. All right, that's important. But now look at the look at verse 19 through 21. And by the way, these are scriptures which I think that you ought to read about once a month. And you need to get down through this list and you need to say, "Am I guilty of any of these?" Because it's very important that you that you stay clean in this area. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. They're manifest. Why are they manifest? Because they're always in abundance. There's never been a time in history where these works of the flesh can't be regularly seen and pointed out. They're all over the place. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of people try to make that into heaven. I just heard a thing recently where some brothers were trying to make it into the millennial kingdom. I don't believe either of those. I believe the kingdom of God there is the kingdom of God mentioned in Luke seventeen twenty through 21. You can read it some other time we're not going to do it now and Romans 14:17 Romans 14:17 says about um the kingdom of God is righteousness joy and peace in the holy ghost in plainer words what I'm trying to say is if you're messing around with these lusts of the flesh you are not going to have a real good relationship with your father in heaven you know it's kind of interesting cuz when you're a kid and you're doing something wrong you took something or you did something and your parents didn't catch you yet, how's your fellowship with your father or your mother? Not very good. Usually you're trying to hide from them because they can just look at you and know you're guilty, you know. And so you're, you know, you don't have a good relationship. And so it is when we sin, these lusts of the flesh, when we're messing around with one of those, you're not going to have a good relationship with God. You're not going to have righteousness. You're not going to have joy. You're not going to have peace. So go down through that list sometimes and, and, and just look. Strife. Strife is mentioned there in verse 20. Now, a lot of the brethren get into strife. They'll clean their lives up. They're, they're doing real good. They're not drunkenness. There's no adultery. There's no fornication, idolatry, witchcraft, none of that. But then they'll get messing around with strife. They'll fight about things when they shouldn't. They got it. They just got it. I got to tell it. You know, I got to tell that guy off. No, you don't. You know, hey, if somebody doesn't want the truth, if it's just going to make strife, don't mess with it. You know, it's just I'm praying for you. See you. You know, you don't you don't have to stick it to everybody. I mean, that's that's strife. Uh, emulation. There's another one. Are you putting yourself up on a pedestal above other people? That's what emulation means. All right. I'm Dr. the Reverend Dr. So-and-so. That's emulation. 
That's a lust of the flesh. That's not spiritual. All right? He that's greatest among you is to be the servant of all. All right? You've got to watch that. Verse 22. Now, here's what you should strive for. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, militancy. Oh, I'm sorry. Meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You know, it's, it's interesting because you have on the left hand, you have these modern Christians that's just all love and they're sissy and everything. And then a lot of Bible believers, their reaction to it is to go the act, absolute opposite and just be a total jerk and just slamming everybody and screaming at everybody and getting in everybody's face. No, that isn't it. You're to go through that list there. Love. Gentleness meekness oh that's effeminate no it's scripture and you gotta you gotta keep that stuff in mind don't be a jerk to people you know the servant of the lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves second timothy chapter two that's what we're supposed to be as christians we're not supposed to be jerks with people verse 24 and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay? That's important to keep that stuff in mind. All right? And, and by the way, if you doubt your salvation, you're going to have a real hard time manifesting the fruits of the Spirit. All you're going to be doing is just trying to keep yourself saved. That's what your life is going to be about. And how are you ever going to lead anybody else to the Lord if you yourself don't know if you're saved? You know, real real good one there. So the point is, are Christians saved? Well, yes, I do believe that they are. I believe that you're sealed unto the day of redemption. I believe that your salvation comes from God and that you are a purchased possession, and that you cannot lose your salvation. Now, if you want to believe differently, well then, go ahead, be self-righteous, spend your whole life doubting your salvation, whatever. Never amount to anything. These people that doubt their salvation, they never amount to anything. Just self-righteous is all they are. Uh, if you want to pervert the Scriptures, go to other dispensations, go back to the Old Testament, go to the Tribulation to prove that you can lose your salvation, well, go ahead. <laughs> You'll never amount to anything, you know? But our hymn that we sang this morning, I'll just read the first line of it here. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. What are you basing your salvation on? It needs to be based on Jesus Christ. Okay, that's it for this morning. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701 or you can donate online through PayPal at our website www.kingjamesvideoministries.com Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.